it reconcentrates the mercury into fish. Uh, dioxins steadily accumulate in the human body fat. Now, here's an extraordinary thing. The man cannot get rid of it. I mean, very, very slowly. The half-life of dioxin in human tissue is about nine years, so it takes you a hell of a long time to get rid of dioxin if you are a man. On the other hand, the woman can get rid of dioxin by having a baby. Uh, when she has a baby, the, the dioxin that's accumulated in her body fat for 20, 25, 30 years, however old she is when she has that baby, in nine months will move from her body fat to the baby. And what makes, therefore, the highest dose of dioxin then goes to the fetus, and then when the baby is born, more dioxin goes to the baby via breastfeeding. Now, what makes that particularly worrying is that dioxins act like fat-soluble hormones. In fact, they interfere with at least six different hormones, male and female sex hormones, thyroid hormones, insulin, and so on. And these, some of these hormones are extremely involved in fetal development and infant development. And if you interfere with them at that stage, you're going to interfere with the development of the fetus. There's a brilliant um, article by Linda Birnbaum, who works for the US EPA, on the developmental effects of dioxins. I want to just pull out one study. Now, this was a study, it's probably the most important paper that was issued on dioxin, and it was less than one page in length. It was written by eight scientists from, from Holland, the Netherlands. It was published in The Lancet as a letter. Uh, they examined 38 newborn babies. They divided them into two groups based upon the exposure to the mother, which or to, to dioxin, gauged by the level of dioxin in her breast milk. And so we had the low exposed mothers with 18.6 parts per trillion. Yes, we are concerned about parts per trillion when it comes to uh, dioxin. And the high exposed women were about twice that, average of 37.5 parts per trillion. And then they looked at the thyroid hormone levels of these newborn babies. And what they found was that there were significant differences, significant, statistically significant differences in the hormone levels and ratios at just one week of age. Now, why that was so important is that up to this point, the only people that have been investigated with respect to dioxin exposure were vets from the Vietnam with Agent Orange and workers in industry who have been heavily exposed in industry. And so it was considered to be a high-dose phenomenon. Is that background levels of dioxin can interfere with the biochemistry of the newborn baby. If I ask the average person, what is the most frightening uh, toxic substances as far as environmental pollution is concerned? And some of you might say, the things that kill you, you know. Well, I'm not frightened by the things that kill you because we, we quickly find out what they are. What I'm frightened about are toxic substances to which the whole population is exposed that have very subtle effects, very subtle effects. And it takes you years to nail down those subtle effects. And incidentally, this is exactly what happened with lead in the 1970s. There were a number of scientists that were talking about the subclinical effects of lead poisoning. And the subclinical, in other words, we all knew that levels of lead would cause children to have all kinds of problems, including seizures and, and uh, um, whatever, lots of problems. And this would prompt the parents to take the kid to hospital. What's going on with my kid? And then they would diagnose lead poisoning. But what certain scientists were saying is that as one of the effects of outright lead poisoning is damage to the brain, what kind of effects are you having on the brain which don't lead parents to bring their kids to hospital? And this was poo-pooed and poo-pooed. And eventually in 1979, uh, Herbert Needleman at Harvard uh, proved that very, very low levels of lead interfered with the child's mental development. Um, let me now explain the significance here. What I want to explain is this, I'm just going to look at one human trait. Every human trait has a normal distribution. And I'll explain what that normal distribution is in a moment for IQ. But the, the average person would have an IQ of 100. 
This is the so-called bell-shaped curve. Now, I want you to focus on the two ends of this curve. These children over here would be considered above an IQ of, say, 130, 140, very bright. This is where your geniuses are, over here. And down here, less than an IQ of about 70, we have children which we call mentally handicapped. Now, I want you to see what happens when we shift the whole population. I'm going to shift the whole population by just five IQ points. Now, here's the thing. Society would not notice the difference with children walking around with 100 or 95. A parent would not be able to tell the difference in two children's intelligence with a 5 IQ point difference. We're blind to this. However, look what it does to the, to the tails here. It halves the number of geniuses in your society. It doubles the number of mentally handicapped. And that's what we think happened with lead in gasoline. It's also what might be happening with dioxins, etc., on other subtle things in society. The trouble is, if you, if you don't do the studies, you won't find out. So we want dioxin out of our babies. This isn't just radical scientists. This is the Institute of Medicine in 2003 addressing this issue. Strategies to decrease exposure. They said... Fetuses and breastfeeding infants may be at particular risk from exposure to dioxin-like <coughs> compounds due to their potential to cause adverse neurodevelopmental, neurobehavioral, and immune system effects in developing uh, systems. What do they recommend? The committee recommends that the government place a high public health priority on reducing dioxin-like compound intakes by girls and young women in the years well before pregnancy. You don't wait until you think you're going to have the baby to change your diet. You want to, uh, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You, they recommend that you substitute low fat or skim milk for whole milk and foods lower in animal fat. Now, this isn't incidentally advice to women who live near incinerators, industry, traffic or anything. This is advice to all women in the United States about young girls is that not a definition of a crisis? Where you are changing the diet of your population or attempting to change the diet of your population? I say, if you're going to introduce draconian measures to address this issue, then for God's sake, direct the draconian measures about the, uh, towards the entities that produce these substances. Whether it's the use of chlorine in bleaching of paper, whether it's in incinerators producing dioxin, or the chemical industry that continues to use organochlorines. That's where the draconian measures to, should be delivered. That's where we have to apply the power of government. I, I, remember, I remember in Germany, pediatricians were talking about getting women to limit their breastfeeding. They said, look, this is the argument that they used. Um, the first three months, most of the benefits are con con uh, transferred in the first three months. So breastfeed for three months, and then hedge your bets and stop breastfeeding for the next six months or whatever. That's, that was the advice. And I remember, I, I just know where she said it, I know what she looked like, and I know how I felt when she said it. She said, this is a pediatrician, when you tell a woman to limit her breastfeeding, you're looking at the beginning of the end of mankind.